So this is Let Us Interrupt You here on Sunday, May 28th, 2023. This is the NFL Prime Time, well, one of their theme songs they do here to uh, review every football game. I actually plan on doing this when reviewing the Celtic game. I know how NBA crisp it is. I'm going to try and put a different theme song on um, for the time being when I do the uh, Game 7 review for the uh, Celtics and Heat game for tomorrow night. It's not on tonight. Um, what game seven was though? Uh, you know, I I had to say it. game seven last uh, game seven game six I should say. I'll talk about game seven on Tuesday. Uh, game six last night. If I had to describe a word for it, I thought it was an instant classic. It looked like the Celtics were going to run away with it. Uh, just an instant classic of, of a finish. The game itself, you know, it it's not one of the best playoff games I've seen to stay alive in a playoff game. But if I had to describe what it felt like, it felt like a playoff game that the Celtics needed to win. And they almost blew it. And they were lucky, thanks to one Derek White, who in the end hit the uh, tapping shot to put this game away at the buzzer and win by one point. Surviving by one point. And... It's hard to believe this is going to a seven-game series. I cannot believe that Boston won this game last night. I was for, for thinking for sure that this was, like, worst-case scenario finish because I thought to myself, you know what? It was a great ride, but there's going to be a game seven. It will be back in Boston. I can tell you right now, I, I feel like Boston has gotten over the hump now at this point of avoiding losing game seven type of games because the last game seven they lost – and if we had to go back and think about this for a minute for the Celtics, go back to 2018, where they lost to LeBron James and that weak Cavalier team they probably shouldn't even have lost to in the first place. I mean, <coughs> if we're going to be realistic here, that's what it's played out as. And this game was not pretty. I mean, Butler was not great in this game. Tatum was not great in this game. Butler sucked, if you want my honest opinion. Want, want, want me to describe Butler's performance? Terrible. He was 5 for 21 in the game. He had eight assists, though, which made up for it, and 24 points. He had 11 rebounds. I said that backwards. I don't know why I said it that way. But he had 24 points, 11 rebounds, eight assists. Abeo uh, was 4 for 16. If you had a good look at the combined numbers for this game, they were 9 for 37. Think about that for a minute. 9 for 37 combined, both Abeo and Butler were in this game. That's not going to win you a game. The fact that this game was even closer than what it was was kind of disappointing. Uh, Vincent was back in the game. He really wasn't that great. He made no difference on this thing. And realistically, like I said before, he wasn't a major loss for the Heat. I mean, it gives him a little boost, but it's not like it's a major boost. Uh, Stress was in there for 25 minutes. He only had 10 points. Vincent had 15. Abel had 11. Martin had 21 points and uh, 15 rebounds. He had a double-double last night. So did Abel with 11 points and 13 rebounds. But, I mean... This game in of itself, I mean, from, from point A to point B, this was all Boston last night. Uh, Miami had one lead in the game. It was 11-9, to nine, uh, but it, it was just a runaway at that point. It was a foregone conclusion that this game was going to be um, interesting for the jump. Uh, Brown made a two-point shot to open up the game. Struss had a three-point shot. Uh, Bama Bio made a jumper, made it 5-2. to two. Brown got a uh, back-to-back shot there. 22 foot shot. Thought it was a three, it was a two. It's five to four. Um, Caleb Martin had a two point shot. It was assisted by Matt Kostrus. Marcus Wire had a wide open a three point from the left hand side. 27 footer. Bangs it home. Uh, makes it seven seven. Brown had an 18 foot pull up. Made it nine to nine. Martin had 11 to nine. Uh, 16 foot shot there. Made it 11 to nine. Horford with a dunk. Um, and Tatum got fouled. This was a, that, that really changed the whole momentum here. This was all on Boston's side after this uh, after this foul. But I, I think it was on Martin, I believe. Um, and Tatum had hit all three of his free throws there. Made it 14-11. Later on, first quarter, uh, uh, Robert Williams gets a layup there with the assist there by Brown. Made it 22-20. Williams again makes another shot there. Made it 24-20. And Jason Tatum with a 21-foot step back. Jump shot. Drills it. Six-point lead for the Celtics. Smart gets a three-point shot there, makes it 29-21. Derek White with a three-pointer of his own, makes it 34-27. Now, the Celtics in this game was seven for 35 from three. And 
I really thought realistically they would be a lot better here. I thought this was actually be the reason why they lost the game. But obviously they didn't lose last night. They are now going to a game seven on Monday. Thanks to Derek White, which I gave the spoiler on that one earlier. Second quarter uh, was 35-32. Uh, Marcus Martin makes a pull-up j- jump shot there. At the, at the last position by the Heat with a three-point by Duncan Robinson. Uh, Gabe Vincent with a, with a three-pointer of his own made it 38-35. Tatum got fouled. He made uh, three free throws there. Made it, uh, or actually he made two of them. Actually made it 40-35. Then he made two more. Made it 42-38 after a uh, Gabe Vincent three-point shot. Um, Tatum got a, a two-point up, uh, 14-footer, made it 44-39. Later on, Tatum again was 46-41. Tatum made a two-point, uh, two-foot shot there. It was amazing layup, made it 48-41. And this right here was the, I think, was an excellent dunk by Robert Williams. He just slammed this home. This, uh, this pass right here, two-foot dunk, bam, it was perfect. This, this had to be the dunk of the night right there. No look, just basically slams it home. This was like a, a video game type of dunk. Uh, Jason Tam made a driving layup there, which made it 52-41. Timeout Miami. Uh, they got back from timeout. Uh, Mac and Struss hit a three-point shot there, 26-footer, 52-44. Tam made, made it an 11-foot driving floating jump shot. They made it 54-44, 10-point game. Vincent with a three-pointer, made it 54-47. Later on, Butler makes a driving layup there, made it 55-49. The Heat were trying to get back into this game. They were not going to quit. Uh, everybody kept missing their shots in the end there. It was it go, went to 57-53 at the half. So they're up by four. Third quarter, I'm going to fast forward through this. 66-63 at their uh, Caleb Martin makes a three-point shot. Marcus Martin with an answer for his own made a 69-63. Six-point lead for Boston. Um, they were reviewing on whether or not Caleb Martin shot a three-point shot, I think. I don't know what the hell was going on with this game. This game was wild. They couldn't figure out what was going on with the scoreboard. Anyway, Brown had a six-foot uh, shot there by White with his sister. made it 71-65. Robert Williams with a dunk of his own made it 75-65. By the end of the third quarter, it was 79-72. So that's what really... Got the crowd going there for Boston. Got the whole bench going for Boston. Fourth quarter comes around. I'm, I'm going to fast forward through this. This sequence right here. This is the sequence here that, that, that I thought made my dreams dash with this ridiculous foul call here. Uh, how in the world Horford found this situation, I'll never know. But I'm going to fast forward right to the sequence here. So it's 102-100. Uh, Horford uh, fouls Jimmy Butler here. He's going. It, I thought it was a two-point shot. But both his feet were clearly behind the line. He was going for a shooting motion there. He was falling down. Horford should have never touched him there at that point. Butler should have just whiffed and just flopped there and made it obvious that he wasn't going to touch. The fact that Horford even leaned in and touched him to try to go for a block, that was dumb. He's falling forward on you. He's trying to get you to take the foul. I mean, that's, a, that's an easy rookie mistake. And Butler, of course, made all three of his shots there. Then Swart gets 20-foot shot. Uh, this was supposedly a 27-foot three-point shot. I thought it was a lot shorter than that, but I guess it was definitely ruled it as. White gets the offensive rebound, tips the shot in at the buzzer. 0.1 seconds left. White makes, makes the shot. They were trying to say that he didn't make the shot at that point, which I don't know how he couldn't have made it. But something said they made it at this point. My, Miami fans thought they won the game. One fan actually went on social media and actually posted after whether he'd actually won to go in the NBA Finals, and then they reviewed it, and then he had – Redelete the post and everything. So it was, it was, it was pretty sad that that kid had a post. I don't know who the kid was in the account, but who made the account there and posted that. But it, that ended abruptly. Uh, White again gets a tip and shot. Suns are up. Suns end up winning the game 104, 103 at that point. But let's go back to the the, the point of attack here. Uh, Celtics are up by uh, by six here or by four, I should say. Team with a two foot layup there. Derek White makes a three-point shot with about five and a half to go, made a 95-88. Marcus Smart with a driving layup and, and the and one. Makes it, makes it a 10-point game, a 98-88. Butler goes in line for two free throws there. Tanner gets two free throws, made it 100-91. Vincent with a, with a, with a uh, driving layup. Butler with a three-point shot, made it 196. And then Butler made it, uh, I think it was a uh, 
was it who was the first no foul and the other end for Butler. So Butler had to go to the line again. Then Butler made it and one. So Butler had the ball in the last position within about four or five minutes each time. And it didn't pay off. Because in the end, the Boston Celtics survived this game. They will now have a game seven back in Boston. And I'm going to tell you this right now. If Miami didn't look tired last night going to that start of that game, I don't know what to say here. But Miami at this point has only led once in the last two games, and that was last night. They didn't lead in game five. They barely led in game four, if anything. Um, because Boston basically ran around where it was. So really three games they have not led. And I'm going to say this right now. I think Miami took the, the gas, the, the foot off the gas pedal here. I, I, I guess say right now they completely stopped um, trying to make something happen out of this out of this thing. I think they just basically thought they had us in the bag because they were up 3-0, and they figured they weren't going to come back. This is something to show that they had heart in this series. And I got to tell you right now, I, I do not see, even with Denver with this much rest, Boston losing the NBA Finals now at this point. I don't. I think they win game seven. I think they're going to win that series. I think Miami at this point is cooked. I think this is the best performance you can get out of Butler in a game like that. You cannot have another game like that of your Butler going five for 21. And the problem with him is that he doesn't know how to execute bigger games when everything's all dependent on him in a certain situation. And it's not like Miami has the advantage here because they got to go, go to Boston now and try to get the win in, in Boston. They're not going to be able to. Um, I just don't believe they have the heart as much as Boston has. I don't think they have what it takes to, to finish this series up. I don't. I think Butler came in overconfident. He basically jinxed himself. I'm not trying to jinx myself here, but if Butler and Abeo play like this, and at one point in this game, and, and here's another way of thinking about this, they were they ended up going, I believe, and I think it was a ridiculous number at this point, that, to say it as it is, but here it is. They went 15 for 55 in the paint. That team should not be going 15 for 55 in the paint at all. They got some players that do excellent jobs making baskets in the paint, including Bama Bayo. There's no excuse for this. So to me, when you go 15 for 55 in the paint, that's a problem. That was not a good thing. That's not a good stat to have. It really isn't, especially if you're if you're a team that's trying to pull out this, this series win at home, to clinch it at home. You do not do that. And Tatum last night, looked, I mean, despite the 31 points, he sucked shooting the three ball last night. Didn't make a single three-point shot at all this game. What stated was the free throw shots. I mean, he went eight for 22 in this game. What do you think about what do you think about the other eight shots? They were all three-point misses. All of them. Horford went 0 for 2. Smart went 4 for 11. He was the best three-point shooter of the night. Derek White was the best three-point shooter of the night. And Brown went 0 for 4. Brown and Tatum went 0 for 12 combined from three, and they still won this game last night. Grant Williams was sucky last night by the three-point shot last night. It was, it was not a good three-point night. This was the worst three-point shooting all year by the Celtics. It's not even close of how bad this was for the Celtics. Probably one of the worst the Celtics have ever had as a tangent between Brown and Tatum. 0 for 12. Have you ever heard of that stat before? Even with Brad Stevens around, with Ime Doker around, hell, even with Doc around. And Doc never coached these guys. But any Celtic tangent going 0 for 12 from 3, you'll never hear that. Ever. So that surprised me. Miami went 14 for 30. They went actually, and as a finished top team here, they went 33 for 93 in the paint. And 15 for 55 came in late in that second half. Because most of that first half, I, I mean, I, they made 24 more shots in the paint within, between the third and fourth quarter. Fine. But Miami should have never, should have never lost this game by one point. They, th this game would have been should have been a 20-point win at best for the Celtics. This Celtics team is just too much. Too much for Miami to handle. It's that simple. Um, as far as depth goes, Robert Williams' time. like Robert Williams' minutes have helped, believe it or not. Which is kind of insane to think about at this point throughout the series. Because if it wasn't for his minutes, I don't think the Celtics right now would actually be in this conversation. And a 3-3 tie in a series that, that, it, that has this much importance as this series does. And I think his presence defensively helps his presence, especially in the offensive side of the ball helps as well. Uh, has he played like a guy at this point that, that should be on the floor a lot longer than 17 minutes? Yes. We've seen that the guy can go for 30 minutes. Didn't look gassed. 
I think the rest of the team looked gas more than he did, though, because they couldn't basically believe how healthy he was. And if you kind of think about it, really, they got all their energy back and, and right back to status quo to Robert Williams getting less than 20 minutes in the game. So, I, you know, I don't know what happened in the series here that, that forced this to happen, but if this is just an excuse right now to, to have no rust heading to the NBA Finals, which is, by the way, two days away or three days away pretty much, I mean, you get what you get. But, I mean, this is a game last night that proved that the Boston Celtics right now are going to win Game 7 and go on to the NBA Finals and face the Denver Nuggets. That might be a seven-game classic, too. And I, and I and it wouldn't surprise me because I think realistically we're going to see a lot of seven-game classes going forward with the Celtics. They're all about the Game 7. As far as I'm concerned, I don't think they're going to lose Game 7 tomorrow night. I don't think they have the team that chokes anymore. I don't think they do. Uh, I just think realistically they have a team right now that just won that got over that hump of the, the Game 7. Think about it. They, they faced Philadelphia so many times in Game 7s, it's hard to believe how many of them they've won. Um even now, and, and people want to look at it and say that they, they want to forget that. Like last week in Milwaukee, they beat, beat the Bucks in seven games last year with Giannis Antetokounmpo, the defending champions. And then the Miami Heat in a game in a seven-game series in Miami. Now you got to retell that story again, only this time around it's happening in Boston. So to me, this should be a no-brainer. The Celtics should win game seven. I think they will win game seven. And I think realistically, your finals MVP – depending on Tatum and Brown play, they play god-awful here. And White and Smart are the ones that save your team. It should go to either one of them because they're the real reasons why you actually are in this situation right now. But one of those two last night, you would never won this game, period. This would have been a, a five or ten or ten point loss for Boston if it wasn't for Smart and Derek White stepping up and Robert Williams. So just saying. Uh, games five last night, which I – I told you this before, and I'll say it again. I told you so. I told you so. I told you so. I told you so. This would be a game five winner for the road team in Vegas. And what do I? What? And sure enough, that's exactly what it was. Uh, Dallas Stars went into the Vegas Golden Knights last night. They did the four to two win last night. Uh, Delandro got two goals last night for Dallas. Robinson got a goal as well. Stevenson got the goal for Vegas. Uh, Vegas started up with a, with a one nothing lead, and it was a two one lead after that. After Glennon then tied it up for Dallas, and then Stevenson got the the go-ahead lead goal. But then Dallas just ran away with it. Uh, Robinson got a goal. Then Delandra got uh, – Delandra, I think, got uh, my almost got a hat trick here, actually. Would have had a hat trick, actually, um, in the game. But it was Glendon, Ding, Robinson, and Delandra twice in the third period that sealed the deal and got the 4-2 victory. I got to tell you this right now. I, I just can't see this not being the same story now that the Dallas Stars – that that this does not go into here because I have a funny feeling that we're going to see a three Oh deficit where in hockey here, where Dallas gets to win here and wins that whole series throughout, because unless Vegas has that road magic in them to pull out that win, I just have a hard time, you know, accepting the fact right now at this point that we're going to see a Bruce Cassidy joke, joke job at head coach. I think he chokes a lot at head coaching. A lot of people want to sugarcoat it here. He's the old version of Mike. Br if I describe what Bruce Cassidy's coaching career has been like up to this point, He's been a choke job artist in the playoff scenario where he either relaxes too much or he just or he just just chokes in the biggest moments possible. It's just I don't know. I don't know what to believe anymore. Ugh. But Bruce Cassidy has choked a lot in his head coaching days and Boston to, to, and, and and it's a Boston Bruins thing. I get it, but it seems like here it's going to start a new narrative here in Bruce Cassidy. It is in Vegas, and I think Vegas realistically is another choke artist uh, town in sports where they choke very easily in sporting events. It's going to happen when 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 the Las Vegas A's eventually become a thing. Like it's not they're not, they're not going to win championships. They're going to be known as a team that chokes. Um. I mean, think about it. They 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 practically lost the Stanley Cup final in a gentleman's sweep. They won Game One in 2018. Then they lost the Game Two. They lost Game Three and Four. They came back for Game Five and they got eliminated. To me, this is like the same exact scenario playing out here because I don't think Bruce Cassidy is a coach where 
He's known to be a winner. He's known to be a choke artist, choke job. Mike Brown was the same way in Cleveland with LeBron James. The guy was known to be a choke artist. The state was too big for him. It happened here with the Sacramento Kings this past year when he was coaching in the playoffs for the Kings. I mean, it's the same thing. Bruce Cassidy is the Mike Brown coaching debacle that is in, in the sports world where the moment gets too big and then he and he just starts to lose himself as a coach. And the teams and the teams pick up on that real quickly. So I'm just saying, it's one of those scenarios where Dallas now has got too much star power on there for Vegas to handle. And especially now when it's going back to Dallas, it's not gonna be very easy for Vegas to close them out here. And I think that's gonna be that's gonna be a, be a huge problem. I think going forward here. We'll see what happens now going forward. But I, I again I just I don't know what to think here other than Dallas gets a series win. They come back from a 3-0 deficit here. I, I I think it happens. I think it really does happen. Anyway, we got some NFL news to get into, which is kind of interesting here because there's not there's a lot going on this year. So I I, I meant to mention this on the Monday podcast, but I completely forgot. So the owners agreed to have games flexed from weeks 13 to 17, which means. For a lot of these teams, they're going to try and make the games a little bit better. The problem is it's conflicting with players getting rest in between. Now, and it also hurts fans that want to buy tickets for the games and they already got their plans planned out months ahead of time. To me, I hate the idea of it too because me as a fan, like let's say I want to go to a um, – and, I'm, and I'm a, I, I want to say let's just – Make or take here, a Patriot game that involves Buffalo. Let's say Buffalo plays them, and it's a it's a Sunday afternoon game, and for whatever reason they decide to flex it on a Thursday night, which that would suck, because at that point you you just brought the ticket three months ahead of time. All is to be told, oh yeah, you you gotta, it, it, if you want to go, it, it's only on a Thursday night at this point, and it's gonna suck because it's gonna change the whole ticket around, and it's gonna confuse those security guard people for. Try us to let us in, right? By the way, they need a 28-day notice in order for this to, to work out. This, this is going to be one of those things where it's it's not going to be good. At, like, I know what they're trying to do at this point. They, they know Thursday night football sucks. They know every matchup they put on every year to start the year out knows they're terrible matchups. And most of the time they are, and they never get changed, and they never get flexed. The problem is, flexing Sunday night games, I don't mind it because you want the better matchup on prime time on Sunday night. Is Thursday night at this point really that important to flex? No. It's not important to flex because realistically, who cares? It's not Amazon Prime anyway. We can get the highlights on ESPN the next day. It could be good content for my podcast on, on a Friday. That's all it is. There's a game on this week. Great. I'll report it on a Friday. Great. I don't mind it at all. Like to me, like that, like that's what it is. And I listened to the Valentine show, which is which is a radio show out for Detroit Sports. And he put it best, Thursday night football is like JV football, J- junior varsity football for high school. It's basically what it is. There's no specialty behind it. Nobody watches it. Nobody cares about it. And it, it, it's like it's it's not the bread and butter. Unless it's on a holiday, the, the, the Thursday night game. Otherwise, it's great. But And what happens now at this point if you start flexing Black Friday? Which that, by the way, is going to stick. I mean, that, that, that really is. I hate to say it, but that's going to really stick around. I mean, to me, it, you know, if they start flexing games, into, let's say they start black doing Black Friday this way. Let's say they decide Black Friday. You know what? Dolphins, Jets, we move that to a primetime game, and we'll take a prime thing up and put on Black Friday instead. Because to me, I think Black Friday, I mean, yeah, people are, gonna be, are either going to be working or staying home, but I don't know. I mean, to me, it's, it's, it's such pish posh at this point with that freaking – uh, flexing to me. Flexing is good for Sundays and Mondays. Otherwise, I'm good on, on Sundays and Mondays. There, there, it should not be a realistic thing for Thursdays. A lot of owners are, are on it. Some owners are against it. Um, the majority of the vote, I think, was like 24 to 8, I think it was, for the uh, voting for yes for the flexes, which means now they're going to come up with 28 days of figuring out why they, they think this game should be on Amazon Prime, which to me, realistically, nobody's going to care if it's on Amazon Prime. You want to take that crap matchup of Amazon Prime? Fine. If you think it's going to do any ratings for 
And really, it's just an excuse for announcers to actually broadcast a better game. That's all it is. They have their broadcast meetings every year. They look into the match and they go, oh, Jesus Christ. Can we just flex these games? Like, why do we have to freaking do this? That's all it is. It's to help out the broadcasters who know they got to go out on a crappy streaming product to try to broadcast a game. And, it, and it, at worst, it's a horrible game. So that's all it is, really. So all it is is a, is a, is a little little present for the, for the, for the announcers out there that, that, that give them a glimmer of hope of a better match that they can change it up with and they ran a broadcast. Because realistically, the Thursday night product they put out last year wasn't really that great. It wasn't. Hell, my, Al Michaels and, could do a lot better at broadcasting at this point, but what he had for a partner in Kurt Herbstreit just didn't gel at all. Kurt Herbstreit was terrible for this for this whole thing. Al Michaels is showing his age. That's pretty obvious. He's got no uh, he's got no patience when it comes to uh, green professional broadcasting. And Kurt Herbstreit is a pretty good broadcaster. The problem is he's not NFL type co- of professional. He's more college-type broadcasting, which is why you get what you get. So I think that that the the, the flexing of the football games is only going to make it easier for the broadcasters. Only going to make it easier for the owners out there that think they're going to make money off this, but they're really losing money. Because at the end of the day, you're going from a TV product where the Nielsen family is all cable-oriented. The streaming stuff at this point, it, it, it's stupid. I mean, unless you want to put it on YouTube TV, fine. I got no problem with that. The problem is with YouTube TV is at this point is if you miss out on the end of the fourth quarter or the start of the fourth quarter and you miss the entire game, that's going to be a problem. Whether it's playoffs, Super Bowls, you're going to have a blackout Super Bowl literally with actual people that can't watch the actual end of the games. That is going to be a problem for a lot of people. And you pay them, a, and you pay them how much a year for that? Or how much a month? Now, I, I I know it's not much, but when you want something, you want it done right. Why do you think I go to cable route here? Two hundred sixty-eight dollars. Am I gonna have to worry about a blackout on my TV in the middle of a football game? No, I'll wear, I'll see a little glitching rainbow, but I won't miss the freaking game. I won't miss the broadcasting. I won't go into a complete black darkness where I don't hear anything on my TV, which. I heard a lot of people went through with YouTube TV with 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 uh, during the NBA playoffs. Could you imagine going through that with the NFL playoffs or any any other sport playoffs? That's terrible. Baseball, a lot of people won't mind because people hate baseball, but you're not going to be able to do that with football. Now, Amazon Prime hasn't had an issue yet. The problem with Amazon Prime is when you want to click on uh, uh, go back on cable TV, you got to log in. You got to get the actual right setting to the whole thing. It doesn't make you go back to where you were. Streaming sucks. Especially if you not don't have a, a good history with a good Wi-Fi. You're going to get the buffering bullcrap every time. And it's not going to fast forward to where it is on the next play. If you're stuck in that thing, you're going to be waiting all night long to get back for it to get back into live mode because you can't fast forward through it. So if you want to go through that with all that streaming stuff, go right ahead. If you want to put your fans through... Uh, instead of just simple cable television, you know, where yes, it's going to get expensive, but let's be realistic here. When cable is no longer around, streaming will have the exact same issues when prices wise. The only difference is, is that they're going to screw you over and take your money and you'll be able to watch the game. Do you really want to risk that? I sure as hell don't. That's why at this point, you better hope and pray that these freaking flexing things I know it's week three, 13 through 17. It's only four weeks of flexing. It's not really a big deal. It's not really ideal. But keep it the same. I, I say realistically, if you want to flex some games, just keep it on Sundays. That's it. Sunday, Monday. Switch it around. Whatever you want to do with it that there, that's fine. But I say there's no point of flexing, of, of trying to flex yourself into a Thursday night game, especially when you've already played one. That's a whole other ball game right there. But all this is is a competition for the broadcasters, you know, to try to swindle themselves uh, uh, to swap it out here, and they go from having a great game they broadcast into a suck bad game. That's a problem. Now you give it to a well respected broadcaster, Al Michaels probably or, or one Jim Nance maybe, but let's say a, a up and coming broadcaster wants to come out there and broadcast a game, 
And then they're being told, oh, yeah, you're, now you got to travel to this location now, which changes all your plans. It's not like you're not, not going to be able to get in, but it hurts your chances of calling a really good game, and you're going to get called a scrub game. That's all there is to it. Travel wise, they have no problem with. So that that that's that's not going to be an issue at the end of the day today. So it it, it won't be. <laughs> I I can promise you that it won't be for these broadcasts. These broadcasts have no problem with any of this. Um, so the Dolphins doctors that were responsible for clearing my uh, uh, two attack of four after the four concussions this past season were fired. That's by the NFL Players Association at this point. This is according to uh, Sports Kedia Pro Football. They were fired as of uh, actually a couple of days ago, actually. Uh, otherwise, these doctors were terrible. I, you know, I, I mean, the fact they allowed Tua to go back out there with all those concussions, I think was kind of retarded because I think realistically they just wanted this guy to retire at an earlier part of the career to try to get Tom Brady to come around. This owner gave him false hope of thinking that Tom Brady would come out of retirement and Sean Payton would come out of coaching the Saints and practically coach with the uh, Dolphins in 2023 with Tom Brady at, at to foot here, but you cost yourself a, a half a season if you're the owner, and you co and you cost yourself and you, and really your doctors cost yourself a job to make it easier for you guys to get you know Tom Brady, a guy who is done playing football to the point now where he's gonna be trying to go to, into UFC and be in a partnership with Dana White. So if you really still want Tom Brady, the most unmotivated football player, to play for your Unmotivated team in 2023. Good luck to you. Two is your best hope at this point. Your job is to protect this guy at all costs. And now his brains are scrambled, and you don't know what you're going to get in 2023. We don't even know if this guy has CTE or not going into 2023. So that's a problem for Miami right there. That's a huge problem. John Gruden returns to coach. Uh, the New Orleans Saints to partner up with uh, Derek Carr, which I don't know how, how Derek Carr is going to feel about that. But John Gruden is, is supposedly a quarterback coach slash analysis, office analysis, I guess. I guess a consultant. Here's my prediction. The Saints are going to start out crappy this year. Crappy start, maybe. John Gruden takes a job back over again because Dennis Allen gets fired. Because I think this guy is a horrible choice for a head coach, I think, personally. And John Gruden takes over. That's the only way I can see this going this way. This is an easier ex ex excuse to get John Green to be on a head coach again. And you want to know something, too? And, and this is my honest opinion, too, on this whole thing. Washington Commanders can do the exact same thing with Eric Benigni. Get Ron Rivera to have a struggling start. They fire him. Eric Benigni gets better. The Commanders can become a better team. Does that make them make the playoffs? I don't know if it does. The Saints might have a better shot at making, the, making a division win, though. That, that I do believe. That I truly believe. Because it could all be stemming with the idea of maybe – D Hop, who just got cut this week by the Cardinals. You know, he didn't say that he wanted to play with Derek Carr and the Saints. I mean, you got Michael Thomas there, you got DeAndre Hawkins, and you got Alvin Kamara. I don't know if they got the cap space to do it. I don't think they do. But there's a lot there at, for options at this point. D Hop already named, named his uh, chop choice right now to be the Dallas Cowboys. But according to his uh, top landing spots, it's the Packers, the Lions, the Patriots, uh, the Ravens, the Lions. I think I said the Lions already. Packers, um, the Giants. I think the Giants were one of them as well, I think. I don't know. I, I have the landing spots right here of where D. Hop would want to go because he was released after three seasons. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out for D. Hop because – Depending on where he goes, I mean, it's should be interesting about where D Hop goes. D Hop, I think, realistically, if, if I if I had to give predictions right now of where he ends up going, it's not to Kansas City, it's not to uh, Buffalo. I think it's to the Ravens. At this point, I was wrong. I didn't like. I don't like the idea of him going to New England because that team is a dysfunctional team as it is. I feel bad for Juju Smith-Schuster to buy into the into the bullcrap that is going on down there, but he knows behind the lines right now that they're not in the right place in the right mind. You got an old head coach who's out of touch, and you got an owner there who just I don't even even know anymore really if he even has any faith in himself or Bill Belichick. So D Hop is not gonna be going there anytime soon. D Hop will be going to 
the Baltimore Ravens. Realistically, the New Orleans Saints could pick him up, though, because if there's one guy that could really generate some positivity for Michael Thomas and want to stay in New Orleans in the long run here, it's it's really him. And it's also Derek Carr. And it's also John Gruden. John Gruden, I think, realistically, will, will take over the head coaching job in New Orleans for Dennis Allen. Those, I think, think will be the early firings, I think, this year in 2023 when the NFL season comes to a start. Uh, Brett Favre was on the uh, made a, a, an important decision on regarding his uh, fraudulent case, a defamation of character that was a lawsuit that was originally given to Matt, Pat McAfee and Shannon Sharp. McAfee was left off the case. However, Shannon Sharp is still on the suing a, 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 a mission for Brett Favre. Brett Favre at this point and Shannon Sharp at this point are at blows with each other, and it's not it's not pretty. But what's worse for Shannon Sharp is that Shannon Sharp uh, got robbed. His LA home got robbed. He lost $1 million. All his stuff was stolen out of his home. That's going to suck for Shannon Sharp. You know, and, 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 and on top of that one, for your house to get robbed, it's just, it's actually unbelievable when you think about it, really. I actually do feel bad for Shannon Sharp. I really do. Despite his uh, being an LA fandom boy and his little, you know, Screaming and hollering at the Grizzly players at this point, creating this ridiculous, you know, tension. That guy didn't deserve to have his has house robbed into and, and all stuff stolen out of there and losing over a million dollars. Like that, that's terrible. I actually do feel bad for this whole thing. And Brent Favre should just drop the lawsuit at this point. Look, you did what you did. You left Pat McAfee alone. Why go why still go out there, Shannon Sharp? He's not talking about you anymore. You're not really relevant in whole news conversation. You, we all know what you did. You know, at this point, you're making yourself look bad by by continuing this ridiculous lawsuit against Shannon Sharp of all people. Shannon Sharp has every right to, to to put his opinion on you know on television of how he feels about a certain player. This is America. The last time I checked, right? He's allowed to have an opinion. If you don't like his opinion, don't watch. That's it. Don't watch Undisputed with Skip Bayless because realistically, people are starting to tune out because people are sick of Skip Bayless. They want him to retire. That's what they're not. They're not not watching it because of Shannon Sharp being on there having dumb takes against Brett Favre. When really in reality, they're not really dumb takes because he actually is telling the truth. Brett Favre needs to, needs to end this lawsuit. It's a ridiculous lawsuit at this point. He knows what he did. He screwed up. It's that simple. I don't see why he needs to continue this lawsuit. Speaking of, of useless lawsuits, uh, the camera that was shoved by Devontae Adams in that Monday night game early October of last year in Kansas City, is not only suing Devontae Adams again, he's suing the Raiders, and he's suing the Kansas City Chiefs for that for that assault. Which I don't even know why this guy even bothers. Why is he coming back to this thing eight months later? It's beyond me. It's the stupidest lawsuit I've ever heard of. But he's coming back for it, I guess, I guess for you know emotional trauma, some injuries, which I don't know what this guy... I mean, this guy is looking for a cash grab. I mean, unless this guy didn't get a raise, I mean, this guy should be should be legitimately... Like wanting to keep his job. You have the best job in the world to basically go into a stadium full of thousands of people to view the games in hot weather, cold, whatever. And you want to throw that away and you want to sit at home and do nothing. And this person, by the way, is in their 20s and 30s. This guy's not an old fart in his 70s who can't who broke his hip. He fell on his ass and he got buried on live television. That's what this is now at this point. It's not even about injuries. It's really about, and this is what actually pisses me off here, it's about basically getting embarrassed and sticking it to the player that embarrassed you and sticking it to an organization that you represent. Why? I don't get it. Are you not happy at your job at this point? Did you not get the pay raise that you want? Did you get demoted when you got your ass you know, push to the ground in front of thousands, millions of people. You don't like that. So now you're going to go after the team eight months later that employed you. Unless they fired you at this point, And that's the only, thing, I mean, that's the only thing I could think of, of they really, the real reason why they fired you in the first place. If they did fire you, which I don't believe this guy even got fired from his job. I heard this in the spun the other day. I heard it from combat sport, Athlon sports, black and white sports, but this was all over here. But the whole thing that gets me is all the stupid crap 
that these people come up with of reasons why they, that this guy gets shoved on his ass. But it's a cash grab to try to get the Devontae, not only just the Devontae Adams, but the entire Kansas City Chief organization, which, by the way, if you're going to go as far as suing the team that, you're, that you represent, that you're employed by, who, by the way, sided with you for this whole thing, didn't like the, the idea of Devontae Adams shoving you in your ass on television. You weren't hurt. You weren't banged up. You got up after, after the fact. The camera didn't hit your face. In fact, you dropped the camera. This wasn't your personal camera. It was actually the property of the, of the uh, stadiums. So I don't really understand why you're suing the team. I don't know why you're suing Devontae Adams again, where you're not going to win. You didn't win the first time, and you're not going to win the second time. So judges can see right through your bullshit, especially now if you're going to try to sue eight months later. That makes absolutely no sense. It doesn't. It really doesn't. Let's see. We got some more NFL news to get into here at this point, and we do. I think we do. Uh, Darren Wallace seemingly takes a, a vile shot at the Raiders after being traded to the Giants. Says, quote, the Giants value our opinions. So Darren Waller uh, still butthurt by the uh, trade with uh, from the Raiders to, to the Giants. I look at it like this. You're in a better place now. It's less drama there. Um, you know, the worry about an injury prone quarterback and Jimmy Garoppolo at this point, the whole Tom Brady rumor storyline here, which is basically Garoppolo injuring his uh, going under foot surgery in March, blah, blah, blah. And there's been no report on this guy at this point and whether or not he'll sit out the entire year. They're trying to create rumors saying how in 2023 that Tom Brady could be a potential starting quarterback for the Raiders. He was being ironed in New England in September 10th anyway, so it doesn't make it really make a whole hell of a lot of sense. They're not going to cancel his appearance and <laughs> take away all and, and, and start losing money out of, out of all those tickets for that one important game where he's going to be ironed at for him to go play for the Raiders in week one. It's not going to happen. Garoppolo's got the team now at this point. That's what McDaniels wants anyway. He does not want to have a thing with Brady. He doesn't. Um, but to me, it it's just the Darren Waller stuff. Like, if he is so butthurt by this, if he does not want to be part of this giant team, then get cut. Get released. He just went on a record saying how he, he can't wait to play for the Giants at this point. And now all of a sudden he's backtracking it and saying, oh, the Giants value our opinions. And my opinion didn't matter in Las Vegas one I, I owed at this point. So basically, this point you're basically saying you're glad you got traded, right? Not the fact that you're blindsided that it happened on your wedding day, by the way. But your opinions don't matter, I guess. Even though you were the star player of the team, you wonder what really happened. You rubbed Josh McDaniels the wrong way. You did it throughout the entire year. Derek Carr did the exact same thing. So you signed with Derek Carr over the guy, and look what ended up happening. He was gone. You were next on the list. I don't know how he finds this surprising. I really don't. McDaniels basically has taken the route of doing the things that Bill Belger would do. It didn't work out for him in Denver. It's not going to work out for him in Las Vegas. Unless Jimmy Garoppolo leads that team to a winning season, that's the only thing he'll invest himself into, is a winning year with a quarterback that he's invested in. Because he was never invested in Derek Carr, and he was never invested in with, with Darren Waller. That's it. And Darren Waller, who's been missing some games this past year anyway, with injury that year anyway. So it's not like this thing really makes much of a difference here. It doesn't. So, I mean, it, it, it doesn't surprise me, really. It doesn't. Um, Le'Veon Bell wants to come out, out of, uh, wants to come back to the NFL, wants to retire as a Pittsburgh Steelers, but he hopes to get one last shot in the NFL. Uh, he went on a, on, a, on a, also on a tandem here. He was on this week's uh, Steel Here podcast, and he said he finally missed, he made a mistake. Uh, Le'Veon Bell wanted to still hear a podcast and decided to spill all the tea over his career. He talked at length about a number of hot button topics, one of which was, was an ill fated choice Bell made to get a greeting and sign with the New York Jets in 2019. Quote, it was like a petty, the guarantee stuff I'm thinking could have. I've just ate, ate it, Bell wondered. Yeah, I probably could have. Yeah, I probably could have really ate it. That's where he ended. It. That's where he basically his whole career was. He basically regretted playing for the Jets. Is what his whole quote was. And I, you know, my only assumption on this whole thing is is that he could have played for any other team. And this is a guy who ended up playing with the Buccaneers. And I want to say he did play for the Buccaneers in 2021. 
I want to say. I, 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 it might have been 2021, I think. It might have been 2020, 2021, I want to say. And he did run a ring with the, the Bucks. I could be wrong on that one, but I'm pretty sure that was him. Either that was LaShawn McCoy. I don't remember who it was exactly. I, I, it might have been – maybe it was McCoy. I, I don't know. Did, did Bell – let me figure this out for a second. I'm trying to figure out where Le'Veon Bell at this point. Uh, I want to say he would. I I I want to say he did go to uh, to Tampa Bay though with Leonard Fournette. That I want to believe that he did. And he said he wants to retire as a Pittsburgh Steeler. I you know to me, the only way he retires at Pittsburgh Steeler if he comes back to Pittsburgh. And I think he will. I don't know if he'll be. The, I don't know if he'll be a number two running back behind Haji Harris, but I don't know how Harris is going to feel about that, but. It's one of those things where it's like you really have you really have no choice here. Just you know, make your amends with the Steelers at this point. Because I, I I think Bell could have sticked around Pittsburgh deep down. I think Tomlin wanted him to stick around had he not left at that point because it, it was a big giant hole within that Steelers organization of not having a running back for a while and rely on James Conner, who they had eventually had to get rid of. So I'm just saying. Uh, Antonio Brown made the announcement of uh, playing with the Albany Empire. He also made the announcement he wanted to make an NFL comeback. Uh, to that, I say, unless he wants to go play with Lamar Jackson and the Ravens and with Odell, DeAndre, it's I don't think it's a good idea. If he wants to go back to Tampa Bay and play with Baker Mayfield, go ahead. I don't know if we want to take him back at this point. If he wants to go and play for Bill Belichick and Mac Jones, be my guess. Because I think to me this kid is making a big mistake, or any team really at this point has made a big mistake. Antonio Brown should not be going back in the football field. This guy's got so many CTE problems. He should not. He's not trustworthy. I, I'm not going to go on in a repeat mode here and go on a long rant about it. The guy's not trustworthy. I don't think he should step back in the football field. He's got major head problems, and I don't think he should be owner of this football team or even play for this team. In fact, Albany should just cut ties with him all together going forward. Because this is stupid. He's using that team you know, to get back in the NFL. That's all he's using his team for. He's not dedicated to this team. So no choice here at this point. To, to, no reason to stick around with this team. None. Uh, Shaq Leonard to resume practicing. There's really no timetable right now for when he'll return. That's according to the uh, pro football uh, talk here. Also, some more news. Uh, Patrick Mahomes went on, a record say, uh, went on record to say that it will be a smooth transition from Eric Bimmy to Matt Nagy as a coordinator for the Chiefs. In the upcoming season, I kind of hope it is. I kind of hope that Nagy, you know, has the same exact play coordinating for Eric Bidmi at this point because I think Matt Nagy at this point is kind of overrated. I, I hope Patrick Mahomes is the same guy with Matt Nagy as a coordinator. I, I I have my doubts. I really do. So I, you know, we'll see. I'm not going to really guarantee anything, and I, sh and I don't think people should at this point. Uh, Jim Brown on Colin Kaepernick before he passed away. This is, uh, this is according to Forbes at this point. He had a phone call that was one for the ages, and this is the, and this is actually the uh, phone call, which I believe this is. I think this is the article for it right here. This is how it sounded, I guess. This is how the uh, video is played out here. Oh, it's loading right now. Am I going to get the clip on here? But apparently he was uh, calling Kaepernick to discuss the uh, whole. Uh... The weather is getting warmer and the trees are in bloom here in Warwick. All you need now is. Oh, we got an advertiser playing in the background. I'm going to turn that down for a second. But uh, this is how it sounded here. For those of us given the home and cell numbers of Jim Brown by the legend himself, you never knew what was coming on the, on the other end. Greatest athlete ever also ranked among the mo most inter interesting persons in the history of the world. And he always answered the phone. Then again, it just seems that way since all my conversations with Brown were nevertheless memorable. Anthem. That was a phone call for the ages by Terrence Moore. For those of us given the home and cell numbers of Jim Brown by the legend himself, you never knew what was coming on the other end. The greatest athlete ever also ranked among the most interesting persons in the history of the world, and he always answered the phone. Then again, it just seemed that way since all of Kaepernick just did before an exhibition game, because it appears you have athletes sort of getting out of that apathetic state they were under for the longest time. Pause for several seconds. 
Well, I think you're calling the wrong guy, my man, said Brown, and I'd seen this before. He was just stretching before preparing to carry his version of a ball disguised as an answer for a long gainer. I don't relate to, um, slight chuckle, situations like this. There's nothing for me to say. Sorry about that. Sometimes, such words meant Brown was done with the conversation. Thanks, my man. Bye. Other times, like this one, you had to stay in your lane. Then James Nathaniel Brown would sprint your way with an answer as somebody who was the epitome of peerless at so many different levels. In athletics, Brown... So Jim Brown, this was a... This, I thought they were going to show an audio clip of Jim Brown actually talking to Owen Collins, Captain. So I apologize if, I, if it was a, just a contributor. They want to disappoint. But um, Jim Brown, not a guy that was uh, liking the idea, it seemed like, uh, of him kneeling down here. That's what my takeaway was from that phone call um, at the time with Colin Kaepernick. The reason I, I want to report this was because I found it interesting that, that, that um, he would even had a, there was even a phone call from Brown to Colin Kaepernick. I guess he applauded Kaepernick for what his, uh, what his choices are. He respects his thing. I don't think he liked the idea of him kneeling down and protesting America. I don't think he liked the idea of doing that at all for the national anthem. And Kaepernick probably try to explain it to Jim Brown, basically it wasn't disrespectful to the, the military. But what you did was kind of disrespectful, though, don't you think? When you're kneeling down to the, uh, to the national anthem? I don't know. This seems like to me it just makes absolutely no sense. I don't know. That, to me, I just think that was dumb. I really do. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Uh, LeBron James will be returning for his 21st NBA season. So, so much for the idea of him uh, retiring at this point. I, I, Like I said before, at this point, I don't think he's going to play with his son. I don't think it is. I think all that idea is out the window. I, I really do. Um, I just think realistically, there's no reason for him to return. Look, he had a good he had a good run this year with the Lakers. Probably one of the better runs since his first year with the Lakers, even though it didn't result in a championship. Look, the fact of the matter is, that felt like an NBA Finals that series. Whether anyone would agree or disagree about that whole thing, look, LeBron James does not need to go out there and top Jordan. At this point, he's already been in the most NBA Finals of all time. At this point, we're at the point now where he's been in nine NBA Finals. He's four. Is he four and five or four and six? See, I lose track now at this point very easily. But in his career, if you think about it, really, he was 2-2 two and two before his return to Cleveland. He went back to Cleveland, lost his third time in the NBA Finals. He became 2-3, and three. won the NBA Finals the following year. That's 3-3. Three and three. Lost the NBA Finals, made it 3-4, and four, then 3-5. and five. And I want to say he went back to the NBA Finals with the Lakers. He's 4-5. and five. So right now at this point, if you think about it, he would need to have two championship wins to tie up to Jordan to six. Because that's all he's going to have to That's all he's going to have to do. The problem is I don't think he's going to be with the Lakers. I don't think it's going to be. If, if, at this point, because let's think about this from this perspective here. Your second year of your contract is your son's first freshman year in college. Then sophomore year comes around. And I think that's going to be your final year. LeBron retiring at this point to me is after his son graduates college. Then his son could take over from there and play with the Lakers. Or, in this case, realistically, play with the San Antonio Spurs and Victor Wembea. That's your best option. I don't see why you don't do that. Uh, Craig Kimbrell got his 400th career save. I think I believe that was on Friday, I believe it was, I want to say. It was Friday or Saturday for the Philadelphia Phillies. So good for him. Congrats to him. I'll get more. And, and uh, Tom Brady, like I said before, I mentioned it earlier, wants to get into the uh, uh, partnership with uh, Dana White. He's hooked up with Dana White at this point because he's got minority start with the Raiders. And he wants to be a part of UFC, it seems like now. They want to go into a business venture with UFC and probably evolve with Vince McMahon. So that should be an interesting partnership right there. Vince McMahon, Tom Brady, Dana White. That, that You want to talk about an interesting partnership, the greatest quarterback of all time, working with Vince McMahon and Dana White? That's an interesting partnership. I would actually, I'm actually more intrigued now because I just thought about this just now because Evolve and, and Dana White are partnering up with WWE and Vince McMahon. So it's like, it kind of makes things interesting, you know? Um, 
I don't know what this means for Tom Brady at this point. If he's done with football altogether, and he just decides to just basically just screw the deal with Fox and just work with you know, um, with Vince McMahon, which I think if, if that's the, the goal here, is, is to try to get this on Fox instead. I mean, if technically he, he'd still be part of the Fox brand at this point, he's not part of the NFL on Fox. It's, the contract is not with the NFL on Fox. It's for Fox. So he could still get that deal for 10 years, $400 million, but be part of UFC at this point. Now, the question is, does UFC and Fox have a partnership going forward? That's in the works, I think. Does that mean he hooks up with Kim Kardashian at the end of the day? Because there's a lot of rumors about going on around that, about that with uh, Tom Brady and Kim uh, possibly being a couple. That's as, as, as interesting that would be, as entertaining that would be, is Tom Brady trying to figure that whack job family out. I, I'm I'm all set with the idea of Brady dating a Kardashian. I don't think he wants to date a wild woman, a woman who's a, who who shows her whole body a lot and shows too much of it. I think he and, and Tom Brady's got some clash. Kim Kardashian, I don't know, is she clashy? I will admit though, I I will say this about Kim Kardashian. I used to have a crush on her, guilty as charged, um, as a kid. So that you know. She impressed me a lot with her with her nice, you know, skinny body and stuff like that. But as she got older and she tried to fake it up with a, with a fake butt implants, I just I was sick of that stuff. And I think Tom Brady wouldn't want to be would be appalled by that, too. So I don't think he'd like the idea of having a fake woman around. The uh, Bucks, by the way, hired uh, NBA head coach and uh, Adrian Griffin, the former Toronto Raptors assistant head coach. So that's an interesting choice. I, I I was surprised with this. I thought for sure Nick Nurse or J.J. Redick were, and even Atkinson were, were a key in this whole thing. But the fact that Griffin got hired out of the blue yesterday, I thought was completely random. So congrats to him. He got uh, he got hired as of today. Um, so we got to get into some uh, scores from, from baseball from – well, I, I might as well get into Friday night scores and Saturday night scores and into Sunday today because it's right around that time that I'm going to wrap up my show here. Uh, currently on right now, it's golf as well. Uh, Brooks Kupka, Kupka won the PGA Tour last weekend. That was in the Oak Hill Tour. Uh, Live Golfer won, which I don't think it really matters at this point. It's not that big of a story. Uh, round four is in progress right now for the Charles Schwab Challenge. And on the leaderboard right now, it's Hall. With 11 under par, uh, Scott Sheffer is in uh, third with eight under. English is in uh, seventh under. Max Holmes got six under. Uh, Ricky Fowler's got uh, five under, tied for tenth. Uh, let's see here. Justin Rose is two under par, tied for 18th. And I think it's um, I'm trying to find uh, Brooks Kepka on here. Which I think they don't even. Have, I, I don't think he even took part of this really. And the people who got cut, uh, Wallace got cut out of Switzerland. Cole got cut. Taylor got cut. Jordan Spieth got cut. He was four over par. Not a good start for 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 Spieth. Very surprising that he was cut that early. I don't know what round that was in, but but as far as we know right now, these scores. Uh, don't, the scoreboard does not lie here. It, it seems like now that Hall will run away. To, I actually predicted that Max uh, Homa, who's tied for seventh right now at this point, would get the uh, get on the leaderboard here, but it doesn't seem like it is. I think Scheffler's going to get back here and take the lead at this point. Now Hall's at now down ten under at this point, so it's not that it's not that uh, far fetched to think that uh, that Scheffler at this point will get to uh, ten under here and Hall will drop down to nine under here. That that won't surprise me. Uh, uh, Team Canada for hockey uh, has just won, got the video over Germany 5-2 in the World Hockey Championship for the 28th time in their first since 2021. So congrats to the, uh, the Team Canada for winning the uh, World Hockey Championship. And we're now going to get into some baseball news. We're going to get into some baseball scores from Friday, which at this point, I didn't talk about Friday. I, I was going to get on the podcast Saturday, but I was sick on Saturday, so I apologize uh, in advance. Uh, Friday scores: Reds beat the Cubs nine nothing. Rays beat the Dodgers nine to three. White Sox beat the Tigers twelve to three. Padres beat the Yankees five to one. Uh, Guardians beat the Cardinals four to three. Giants beat the Brewers fifteen to one. 
Uh, Blue Jays beat the uh, Twins three to one. Phillies beat the Braves six to four. That was the 400th career save, I believe, for Kimball, and it was. I knew it was on Friday. Uh, Red Sox beat the Diamondbacks seven to two. Mets beat the Rockies five to two. Marlins beat the, the Angels six to two. Pirates beat the Maris eleven to six. Nationals beat the Royals twelve to ten. Texas Rangers beat the Baltimore Orioles twelve to two. And the oh, Houston Astros beat the Oakland Athletics five to two. That was on Friday. Last night scores, game twos. Yankees won in extra innings, beat the San Diego Padres three to two in ten innings, thanks to Isaiah Kinfla-Fapla uh, with a walk-off single. Uh, the Tigers got the uh, win over the White Sox seven to three. The Twins beat the Toronto Blue Jays nine to seven. Giants beat the Brewers three to one. Mariners shut up the Pirates five nothing. The Philadelphia Phillies beat the Atlanta Braves two to one. Kimbrel once again, I believe, got the save in the game. I want to say he did get the save here. Uh, with the uh, his seventh save of the year and his 401st save, Phillies take two out of three uh, so far in that series. Dodgers beat the Rays six to five. Carl beat the Guardians in ten innings, two to one. Reds beat the Cubs eight to five. Red Sox victorious again over the Arizona Diamondbacks, uh, two to one. Uh, Garrett Whitlock made his comeback as of yesterday for the Sox. Yes, it was extremely hot, over 100 degrees yesterday in Arizona. Rockies beat the Mets 10 to 7. Marlins beat the, beat the Angels in 10 innings 8 to 5. Rangers beat the Baltimore Orioles 5 to 3. Astros beat the A 6 to 3. And the Nationals beat the Royals 4 to 2. Uh, so far from scores from yesterday, or, or actually for today, uh, Yankees have beaten the Padres now 8 to 6. They're in the bottom of the seventh inning. Uh, the Cardinals beat the, the Guardians 3 to 2. The Detroit Tigers beat the Chicago White Sox 4 to 1. The Brewers beat the Giants 7 to 1. Toronto Blue Jays are beating the Twins 2-0. Reds and Cubs are tied at 3-3 there in the fifth. The Rays beat the Dodgers in a shootout today 11-10. 11-10 today. This was an unbelievable game. Rays take two out of three in this series. They're now 39-16. Uh, Mookie Betts went 0-5 for 5 in this game, but despite that, the Dodgers scored 10 points, which is unbelievable at this point. They scored that much. Uh Martins and Angels are on later on today at 407. You got Pirates and Mariners on today at 410. Red Sox and, and Diamondbacks are on at 410 as well. Uh the you got the Texas Rangers on right now, beating the Orioles now two uh or actually I say they're tied at two two. The Nationals are looking to sweep the Kansas City Royals. They're up two nothing right now in the six. And the Astros and A's are on today at 407. The Phillies looking to sweep the Braves tonight at 710. So that's all the scores there. I apologize. I was looking at my phone right now. I didn't get a chance to hook uh, to stream this up uh, as quickly as I did. Uh, but anyway, uh, so that is the news front on baseball. Caleb Williams, the former Heisman Trophy winner from last season, right now at this point, UFC quarterback Caleb Williams' response to tanking speculation with, about NFL teams because he was uh, hearing the rumors at this point and hearing the uh, stimmings and whether or not that would be a Possible scenario. Not sure why the hell this is not loading. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with this thing right now. I was, I was going to read you an article here on what he said. This is according to Sports Illustrated, by the way, which I'm going to take. <laughs> See, when I, when I switch over to this this, this, this does this all the time. This is annoying. I really hate this. So this is what he had had to say here. Quote, it wasn't any surprise or anything. He told the USA Today, Tom Shad, I work hard to try and be the best. So there's no surprise with any of that. Whatever they talk about on TV or social media, not too pressing, not bothered by it. I've been working hard for many years, or for many, many years to be in this position and have this opportunity to be up on the Heisman and going to get the Golden Trophy at the end of January in Houston and probably going up number one. So, Caleb Williams likes this tanking stuff at this point. I like the tanking stuff, too. Here's the problem with the whole thing. You better hope and pray that it's the right fit for your career. You do not want to go on a team in this one that you're t that's tanking for you, and you end up hating that team. That's the only thing that I, I advise this young lad to do, to, to do exactly that. Make sure there's a team you want to play for. Do a deep research. Because I feel like these guys just don't do deep research when they research these people. I don't think they do. Um, so to me, my advice to you is tread lightly. 
tread really lightly going forward. Because it could be the Saints that could tank. They could say Derek Carr sucks. This is a horrible contract. I don't like this. And say, screw it, we'll tank it, and we're getting rid of Derek Carr. And John Gruden will be the head coach for Caleb Williams. You also have um, the possibility of, and I just thought of this team as well, the Washington Commanders. They have no quarterback right now. They didn't bother drafting one for this year's draft. Eric Biedme at this point is looking to get a HUD coaching job. Ron Rivera is on the hot seat. They sucked throughout the year. He could be gone. And you tank the rest of the way and still fire this Ron Rivera and you get Eric Biedme in there. And I promise you with Caleb Williams, that is going to be a good combination. Otherwise, there's no reason for this. None. There's no reason for any of these teams to tank at this point now going forward. Now, the only thing I can think of, of tanking at this point are the Tampa Bay Buccaneers because they have Baker Mayfield. Caleb Williams could be the number one overall pick for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I say that is the one team that if I'm them this year, would tank for this quarterback. Baker Mayfield this year is not the, not, not the, not the guy, period. He's not the guy. He's not going to be the starting quarterback going forward right now. He's just there for for to be, you know, not to be known as a backup quarterback behind Kyle Trask and whoever else they have, they drag along with them. Because the idea of it is right now is you lost Tom Brady, you need to replace him, and you're not showing investment in the quarterbacks they got in the draft. So you go with a different approach here. You go bigger maybe you, you take it some time at this point, you start to rebuild. Re and not rebuild to the point where you you um because really realis- realistically, if they didn't if they didn't get Tom Brady back, they would have tanked him with Kyle Trask. And they would have gotten this year's draft qu- uh, top quarterback, which would have been Bryce Young or CJ Shroud. They would have done that. Now at this point, they feel like they have the tank now with Baker Mayfield. This is the right approach here. Caleb Williams at this point should tank. You know, or I'm sorry, the other way around. Baker Mayfield and the Buccaneers should tank for Caleb Williams. Caleb Williams at this point should be the, 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 the unstoppable tank on that football field. Firing his cannon of an arm. Using his speed. That guy is, is going to be a tank to be reckoned with. That's what I meant to say. I, I completely botched that. I apologize. But yeah, that's the story. Um, WB's Night of Champions was on yesterday. Uh, the bloodline implosion happened yesterday when, the, when Jimmy J, uh, Jimmy Uso turned on Roman and caused him the, the undisputed tag team championships and lost to Sane and Owens, although Solo was when I got the pin in there. He got hit with a stunner and the uh, Hulu kick. Brock Lesnar forced uh, Cody Rhodes to, ta- uh, to pass out with the uh, Kamara lock. He got the win over Cody Rhodes. Rhea Ripley beat uh, Natalia in 66 uh, seconds in her championship match to retain her SmackDown Women's Championship. Asuka won the Raw Women's title. Uh, Seth Rollins became the first um, official new World Heavyweight Champion for Raw. The uh, big gold is back, sort of, with that new WWE logo on top of it. It looks like the original TNA logo for the new TNA World Heavyweight Championship belt at this point. So, I don't know. I, I, I prefer the big gold over that over that belt. I do. I still do. Like a little nostalgia. Uh, Trish Strash, uh Lost it, uh, or be, I should say, beat Becky Lynch thanks to Zoe Stark. Zoe Stark with her botched finish. Uh, I didn't try to think of if there was any other matches on the show that I'm thinking of at this point that I missed here. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. I don't think there's any other matches on the show that I completely forgot about. Oh, yeah. Uh, Gunther retained his Intercontinental title over Mustaf Ali. Much better match than I thought it was going to be. So that's that. Uh, there was no U.S. title match on the show. Um, that was pretty much it. Nothing else pretty much happened on the show. So I just gave you all the match results on that one. Tonight is Double or Nothing, pay-per-view for AEW. So I will be watching that live tonight, 8 o'clock. Uh, Anna Korean Arena, it's the Elite versus the BBC. Uh, Brian, Moxley, Yuta, uh, Claudio uh, versus Hangman, Kenny Omega, and the Young Bucks. Uh, you have the Fatal Four of the uh, AEW World Heavyweight title, which is uh, MJF, Sammy Guevara, Darby Allen and Jungle Boy. I want to say there was another match on pay per view here. I, I it was I know the twenty man battle royal for the uh, AEW International title. 
Uh, you got Adam Cole versus Chris Jericho in a non-sanctioned match, which is no disqualification. Uh, Sabu, who uh, made his AEW debut, made his return to wrestling, and God knows how long for live television. I don't think he's really been on live television in probably over, I want to say probably in, in about 12 years at this point. So that should be interesting. Um, really random return too. I really still can't, I still can't figure out why he made his return. The only reason I can think of is he's from Las Vegas. I, I'm kind of surprised he wasn't on Talk as Jericho this week. That, that to me, I, that would have been a really interesting podcast to listen to as far as pro wrestling goes. I know I don't cover pro wrestling as much as I should. Uh, nothing really else is pretty much else going on in the fighting world. Uh, I think there was, bo was there boxing on last night? I want to say there was, there probably was. Um, otherwise, uh, you got uh, Warlow versus Christian Cage in a ladder match for the TNT Championship. Uh, otherwise, for this pay per view, it's, it's not really much uh, advertised for this show. I, I don't really remember any other matches here. I don't believe there were. As far as I know, I don't think the uh, House of Black have any tag, uh, trios tag team title on the line. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, there's not really much else to talk about on that show. The show this week I thought was a, was kind of a disappointment. I thought overall, um, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm if I'm missing anything here on this. I, I I don't think I am. I'm pretty sure there was boxing on last night. I know there was some WNBA action that was on yesterday. There's some boxing uh, stuff that was on last. I think it was on tonight. I want to say. Or I guess not. Huh. Uh, what, uh, Leah Wood scores a revenge and outpouring uh, a Marcio Lara in a boxing match last night and a rematch wins back the featherweight title. Uh, and there, uh, Lara won the first meeting between uh, the two, getting outboxed for six rounds before a crushing left hook put Wood down and forced his corner to throw in the towel. It was a very different story on Saturday in Manchester, England. So that happened uh, last night. I want to say, let's see, uh, Hanny, uh, was it Hanny that, uh, Devin Hanny makes a statement in the toughest test to date versus Velasquez, oh, that was back in 2019, never mind. Not really much happened here, I think. I thought there was, uh, Hanny, uh, uh, Hanny retained over Lomachko in his, in his title reign. That was back on May 21st, so that was last weekend. I don't think I even reviewed that. Did I review that? I don't think I did. Anyway, that's uh, nothing else really going on for boxing, as far as I know. Uh, XFL is already over at this point, so nobody cares. Uh, WNBA action was on as of yesterday. I, I'm, I'm going to start covering this for that one, because I think the WNBA, I, I saw a really physical WNBA game yesterday that was worth talking about, which was Connecticut Sun versus New York Liberty. Those two teams went at it. I mean, these girls, uh, at one point, as a Brianna Stewart uh, got elbowed right in the eye. That was the uh, player for New York Liberty. Um, and Haynes got banged up so many times in this game. I, the amount of times this girl fell and just got banged up and kept getting up and playing, got to give her the got to give the girls credit for that. Um, uh, Liberty got the one eighty one sixty five. Uh, I believe this is Las Vegas. Uh, was, it, was it Las Vegas Aces here? Yeah, Aces got uh, are now three and zero right now. They got their win over the uh, was that the, the Sparks yesterday? The Los Angeles Sparks, uh, ninety three sixty five. That was yesterday. Today, you got Dallas and Chicago. You got Minnesota and uh, uh, Aces again playing tonight at nine o'clock against the Minnesota team. Atlanta's playing Indiana. Uh, so far, though, if we had a, if we had to go by the league here so far, and really by conference play. The Eastern Conference right now, the Sun lead the Eastern Conference. They're three and one in the East. Uh, Liberty's in second right now. They're two and one. They just got the win yesterday over the, over the Sun. The Sky are two and one. Mystics are two and two. Uh, the Dreamer are one and one, and the Indian Favor are zero oh and two. Uh, Aces and Wings are uh, Aces are three and zero. Oh. The Wings are two and zero. Oh. The, the Wings, I believe, are. Uh, I don't know. I, I want to say that they're they're. Um, they're not Minnesota, I don't believe. I don't know if they are now. Minnesota's the Lynx, where they're 0-3. Uh, Sparks are 1-2. The Mercury are 1-2. The Storm are 0-2. And, and the Lynx are 0-3. I need to put my phone here right now on. 
on the t on the screen over here, so I want to keep looking down at it. Um, otherwise, yeah, uh, not really much else to say here. You got Major League Soccer that's going on, uh, which we haven't really, I really haven't really been paying attention to. I don't normally report on soccer, but as of yesterday, uh, New England Revolution uh, finished in a draw against the Chicago. Uh, I think I want to say this is the Chicago uh, team. I can't think of the name right now off the top of my head. Because like I said before, I don't cover soccer that much. Uh, they finished in a tie with a revolution yesterday in a 3-3 tie. I think that was Chicago. Was it, was it Chicago Fire? Is that what it is? Is that Chicago? Uh, it's not the... It's not the uh, I gotta look it up real quickly here. But I, I'm pretty sure it was Chicago... Something, I don't know. Uh, they're playing Atlanta on Wednesday. Uh, currently, right now, for scores, uh, Portland is beating... Uh, SKC, which is a sporting KC, one uh, nil, and Columbus is playing Nashville later on tonight. Um, and that will pretty much do it for this podcast here. I apologize for picking my nose there. I just had to pull something out of my nose just quickly. Uh, anyway, so that's that. Oh, one more thing. I I I, I meant to get into this earlier. Uh, Scotty Pippen has uh. Has, has got people a lot of people concerned for the well-being of him. He's been saying outlandish dumb takes on here where people aren't taking him seriously anymore, especially since the uh, Last Dance debut. I would say the Last Dance thing got released. Uh, Scotty Pippen has been negative towards Michael Jordan. They are not on speaking terms with Michael Jordan or Phil Jackson. Uh, he blames the two of them for them not lasting as long as they were in Chicago for that dynasty coming to an end. It was Krause that they really wanted um, – all the veterans should be gone and further rebuild and Phil Jackson to go be gone because Phil Jackson at this point and Phil and Krause had never got, a, got along. No matter how many titles Jordan won, they never got along. He actually blamed, I believe I believe, blamed Jackson for Jordan retiring the first time around from Chicago and not coming back right away. So, I mean, that's, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Um, that's pretty much it. I think I covered what I needed to cover on here today. Uh, at this point, um, we got a a Tom Brady uh, winding up uh, playing in the Las Vegas story. Here's why Tom Brady may not be an option to be an option for Las Vegas. So there, this is just news I just got added in as of two minutes ago. Uh, Raiders add a waiver to Jimmy Garoppolo's contract where he is an injury waiver. So it's a lingering foot injury report resulted in a waiver being placed in the inside of Corvette's contract that gives the Raiders the power to effectively cut him, creating the possibility of him never playing a down for the franchise. Given the Garoppolo underwent surgery in the foot in March and has yet to participate in OTAs, Las Vegas, that has sprouted fodder, the Raiders actually pulling the lever on the Adam, uh, Adam and nullifying the contract. The next question that follows whether or not they should void his deal surrounds who plays correct for the 20, uh, Raiders in 2023. And that's when Tom Brady's name enters the chat. Brady is currently retiring despite the seven times Super Bowl champion saying that this time it was for good. Both on quotes here, there has been plenty of speculation that points to the contrary. So would this be a situation where Brady could realign with his former offensive coordinator, Josh McDaniels, and play with the Raiders in the exiting stage right? For Garoppolo. I mean, if it happens, it happens. I, I just can't see this point. Like, like I mentioned before, I, I say it's a no. I think Brady's done for real. Uh, Brady wants to work with Dana White and be business partners in the UFC. So I think this whole thing is over. There is another option, though. If you want to wait Jimmy Garoppolo, if you do want to consider doing this, my advice to you right now is, is tank for Caleb Williams. There, there's now a, a third team now at this point that I now can put in the fold here at this point that could take for Caleb Williams. And that's and that's the, and that's the one that they should do with it. Go right ahead with it. I, I I'd say go for the go go for the jugular there and do it. I'd say cut it right now. Cut your loss at this point. There, there's no reason at this point to feel the way you feel. Uh you can get a backup quarterback in some um, some draft lottery here to get get Tyler Huntley to go to play for the Raiders this year. Get him from the Ravens. Um, and this whole thing right now here is tank, tank for Caleb Williams. That's it. Like I said before, I'll say it again. I mean, that, that that's 
that's realistically what's going to what's end up happening anyway. Is that well, that most likely will happen? I'm trying to remember if I had an 0 and 17 prediction for an NFL team on here. I'm just trying to I'm just trying to think of it now because I'm thinking about this now. It's like this kind of ruins my uh, like NFL scoring prediction. Um. <coughs> oh. I'm trying to think at this point of, of uh, I, I think there was one thing I thought of here. I'm trying to think at this point now if who because I, I I had some team going zero and seventeen this year. I don't I don't remember who it was now. I'm trying to think at this point, it wasn't the. Uh, And see now, see now, now, this, now this is what bothers me now. It, it, it's it's I'm trying to think of this point. Was <laughs> I think it was um, I can't think of the, the team that, that that I had taken this year going 0 17 this year, right? For Caleb Williams, because I, I, I know I had some team this year. I, I had to look back at my episodes to see if I remember who the team was exactly, but. God, that's going to bother me now. All right. <laughs> I mean, it could be the Raiders now at this point, and they decided to just get rid of Garoppolo altogether, which would definitely ruin my uh, predictions altogether. Um, it could have been the Falcons. It could have been. I don't think it was, but I, it, it, it most certainly could have been the Falcons. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Green Bay Packers, Buccaneers. Chiefs, Broncos, Commanders. Uh, no, I, think, I don't think it. It, not, it, it might have been them actually. It, it might have been the Chicago Bears. Now the more I have to think about it, might have been the Chicago Bears. And I, you know, and I could be wrong. I don't think it was them per se, but that would be possible. I wouldn't put put it past this team. Well, than the Patriots, I know that. Um, yeah, that's gonna bug the crap out of me now. I, I I can't think of this now at this point. So my brain's all mushy. So I'm gonna end the podcast there. Um. Anyway, thanks to all you guys again. I'm sorry I wasn't looking like uh, looking at the camera that much, although I kind of was for the first about 45 minutes of this podcast, but uh. Yeah, I, I, that's not that's not driving me crazy now. At this point, the NFL stands at this point. What I had, because I, I had, I know I had a team this year going 0 17. It might have been the Bears. Now the more I even think about it, I don't think it was Green Bay. Although I could actually, you know what? It might, it may have been, it may have actually been the Green Bay Packers. Who knows? Um, it wasn't Detroit. I know that. I, I had Detroit actually win the NFC North. Um, but yeah, thank you all again for joining the podcast today. I really do appreciate it. Uh, I just had to, I had I had to do the uh, looking up, try to see what team I had on my phone towards the end of the podcast about the stains of what that could have been. But I, like I said before, and I'll say it again: Tom Brady's not going to come out of retirement here at this point. And if this is going to be like a new thing now, at this point where you're going to tank to get Tom Brady and not get Caleb Williams at this point, if that's the goal that the Raiders are going to do at this point, and to avoid the, the whole Jimmy Garoppolo injury prone storyline here. Uh, to me, I think that's a mistake. I really do. I personally, I, th I think that's a dumb thing to do. Um, otherwise, I think it'd be interesting to see how this plays out again because, again, it, it's it'd be interesting here. I actually forgot to, make, forgot to make this prediction. Since Le'Veon Bell wants to come back in the NFL, knowing Alvin Kamara's legal situation, Le'Veon Bell should go play for the New Orleans Saints. I, I think that'd be an interesting story. You got Le'Veon Bell to go there. Um, I don't know what – as far as Sean Payton's contract goes, I think Sean Payton's contract was bought out by the Broncos. So I don't think there's an impact anymore now at this point of Michael Thomas not getting an extension on his contract or for d to go play for the Saints and Derek Carr. 
now don't get me wrong. I mean, the, the, it, it does sound appetizing, the idea of DeAndre Hopkins playing for New Orleans at this point. I still say the Dallas, I still say that the that the Dallas that the Baltimore Ravens do end up getting him. But don't be surprised if Le'Veon Bell comes in into play here. And then you got Michael Thomas who wants to build a big super team around him. That you got Chris Olive in the, in the picture. And I believe they still have Jarvis Landry on the roster. Not 100 percent I although I know he might be a free agent. So you got Olive around there, Michael Thomas, and then you have D Hop there if you're Derek Carr. This can't be a fail. And worst comes to worst, let's just say Darren Waller happens to want to get traded out of the Giants. He's not valued enough, not appreciated enough in New York. Could you imagine a Darren Waller reuniting uh, re, uh, uniting in New Orleans? Waller with the Saints, with DeAndre Hopkins, Le'Veon Bell, Michael Thomas, Chris O'Leaf. Anything's possible here. And depending on what happens now with the Giants this season, and, and who knows if Daniel Jones and Giants are going to be good? Because now you got the Saquon Barkley problem where, where you don't have a running back, and you don't know if you're going to get the same offensive attack that you got right now that helped Daniel Jones out with Saquon Barkley. You're not going to get that with anybody else. And Darren Waller, I don't think, is going, to, is going to like playing with Daniel Jones at quarterback. I'm sorry. I don't think he's going to. I think he's going to like it playing with Derek Carr more in New Orleans than anything else. And I think realistically, and this actually did kind of surprise me, that uh, McDaniels actually has a relationship with any other franchise here besides uh, Belichick and, and the Patriots. Uh, you know, and, and the whole Patriot connection. But the thing of it is, you know, you got uh, – I can't think of the coach's name in a moment here, but you kind of get the idea. Uh, the connection that that McDaniel's has with uh, well, I'm gonna type up the that, type of his name because I, I I know at this point I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I, I know the guy's name for real, Brian Dave. There we go. The connection that Dave and, and McDaniel's have is being you know associates with one another in New England. It it kind of helps. It kind of does help. I'm looking at the TV screen right now, I think. I, that's why my eyes are starting to roll it back in my head. Uh, anyway. Ooh, I just popped my knee. Um, but anyway, Brian Dable's relationship with McDaniels helped out this trade. The problem now here, here is where this trade ends up. Because now it's like it, it's not looking good. Because Darrell Wall at this point saying what he had to say on this whole thing and now it's like he's backtracking here. The question now here is, does Darren Waller want to stay in New York at this point? Or midway through the year, let's say it doesn't work out for him in uh, New York, he goes and plays for the Saints. Or better yet, better story would be is he goes back to Baltimore with DeAndre Hopkins, the team he actually started out playing with. The Ravens feel like complete jackasses. They need another tight end anyway. They lost Josh Olive to the Vikings. You need another tight end. You get Darren Wall to come around. Mark Andrews is, not, is is really lucky to be a number one tight end because if Wall would have been more established in Baltimore, Mark Andrews would have been the number two guy easily. The problem now with, it, with this whole thing is, is you go only got Odell Beckham Jr. there. You need a monumental statement move to make this work. The thing of it is, is that you need another collection. You need another tight end at this point. You need – Mark Andrews will be okay being a number two tight end. I don't think he really cares about being the number one tight end in the league. He already knows that in his ego mind at this point. You can have two number ones at tight end, I think. That's not a problem. That's not even an issue. Mark Andrews, I don't think, is even considered to be a, a, a tight end on, on that roster, but there's another wide receiver because the rest of the wide receivers they have in Baltimore are terrible. But if you have Darren Wall go that goes back to Baltimore – and plays with uh, Lamar Jackson, with Mark Andrews and Odell back and you got DeAndre Hopkins here in the mix. That's a that's a team that could go to the Super Bowl. That's a Super Bowl. That's a team that's gonna win the Super Bowl, in my opinion. They're not gonna lose. Or in this case here, you have somehow some kind of weird thing that happens right now with a with a injury reserve a contract injury and in waiver in his contract, like Garoppolo has right now with the Raiders and. Somehow he gets cut and doesn't play a single down with the Giants at all. He gets an injury problem, and there's some issues with the coaching staff and the ownership, and da 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 da. And 
it could end up being the Dallas Cowboys that can end up taking them with this point with D Hop going to Dallas. I mean, there's a lot of things that could play come into play here because of this situation. Right now, at this point, Jimmy Garoppolo doesn't seem like he's gonna be a Las Vegas Raider for long. And it could definitely change a lot of teams' records in the 2023 NFL season. Now, I think I had the Bears going 0 and 17. I gotta be honest right now, I don't remember, but I don't think it's realistic at this point because they're, they're kind of leaving in Justin Fields. Why would they want to take again? I think it might be in Atlanta now, the more I think about it now. And it might as well be in Atlanta. I think it was Atlanta now. Now now that I think out loud with it, I think it was Atlanta that, that I had going 0-17. Um, I know for sure that I had the Pages going 6-11 and 11 this year. I don't remember exactly what their losses were going to come from. Um, you got Seattle and Baltimore. I mean, well, not, not Seattle, but Seattle could actually potentially, if you think about it really, could get Caleb Williams in a draft and a trade in this scenario. That could happen. There could be a trade and involves because think, let's think about this for a minute. Let's say the Las Vegas Raiders do end up tanking for Caleb Williams in the end of all this, right? Let's say that does happen, hypothetically speaking. Because that could happen. You know, it, it, it's, it's not all that I, that, I, that, I, that I think of this, really. But if Caleb Williams, let's say, gets, you know, goes on, looks at a team and says, I want to be with this freaking team. And he goes to the Seattle Seahawks. The Seattle Seahawks are going to, to trade whatever they got to do to get that player to come here. Now, what do they have a trade value at this point? Let's say Bobby Wagner was on the table at this point. Because I think that at this point, because I don't think trading DK Metcalf is a smart move. I only trading. Tyler Lockett is a smart move. Our training at rookie wide out of Ohio State and, and Smith Nagiba is a smart move. But you have a trade here that does make sense here, which is Bobby Wagner, because he could be on the table for a contract extension, let's say, hypothetically. Right? And Caleb Williams is on the table. Williams could go right back with the idea. You know, and I'm just and I'm looking at at the uh at this per se here, and let's just say this actually does happen here, because right now you, you you see what you you see what you get here with this whole thing. They didn't draft another quarterback here in the draft here. They did they drafted edge rushers and defensive backs here, which I think Seattle had a really good draft here, and I think in general, I think they did. Um, they drafted another running back. They drafted an edge rusher, a wide receiver, and a, and a defensive back that that you know caught went strictly woolen. That right there, you could trade some draft capital with another draft capital here and a player to be named later on. It doesn't have to necessarily have to be, be Bobby Wagner or DK Metcalf. I wouldn't even trade a player on this team, I, but I would trade a draft spot. I would. For any tanking team out there that, that doesn't think they need a quarterback here and they just tank just a tank, they have to be the number one spot, trade with Seattle. Caleb Williams is the right guy. But I think the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are going to mostly end up getting Caleb Williams anyway. I think it, I think the Geno Smith uh, experiment continues in the long haul. I think Geno Smith's there for the long haul here in Seattle. I do. I think even with that three-year contract, they're not going to want to, to to mess with that that guy's wonkiness. I just don't think it's realistic. San Francisco might want to do think about considering you know doing that and tanking. Well, I mean, well, really, I mean, they believe in Trey Lance and they believe in Brock Purdy. I mean, who knows? But I think Tampa Bay. That could that could make sense in the long haul. That that could be the thing that ends up happening. So, the Cardinals as well. I, I, I actually now the more I even think about it now, I think I, I I and I just thought about this as now, and I and I and I just realized I didn't make this prediction on my podcast. I actually uh, looked at this at the at their uh, the release of, of DeAndre Hopkins, and I and I actually forgot to mention this, and, and it's a good thing I'm mentioning it now. I have DeAndre Hopkins going to the Ravens. And I have the Arizona Cardinals tanking and getting rid of Kyler Murray by the end of all this. And John DeGan being a one-and-done head coach. Because at the end of the day, the Cardinals just made the biggest mistakes of their lives at this point by getting rid of this wide receiver. Now, I'd save the money in the cap. The problem with this whole thing is, is that there's no reason for anybody to go to Arizona now anymore going forward. None. There's no reason for Marquise Brown to stick around. There's no reason why for Zach Ertz to stick around. And they're going to be the next to go at the trade deadline. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Marquise Brown went to Buffalo in a trade, and I wouldn't be surprised if Zach Ertz went to Buffalo in a trade as well. 
You want to talk about getting rid of two key players right again there, boom, 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 for first or second round talent? There you go. There's that for you. The other thing is at this point is that you got Kyle Murray, who's out for most of the year with a torn ACL. And he's trying to recover from that. He's not going to be able to get ready for till mid October. Coincidentally, when the trade deadline comes. So, and I just realized that just now because I, I just had the Arizona Cardinals going 0 and 17 because I wanted to bring this up in my pockets because I don't believe in Kyle Murray anymore. I don't believe in Jonathan Gannon as a head coach. Uh, I think this guy was put in a very bad position to, to figure out that Dia, who wanted to stay in Arizona, and I think just decided, you know what, I'm done. I I don't know if they thought he was lying, but D Hop did want to go to Buffalo. I think he really did. I think he deep down wanted to go play for Buffalo before he went to Arizona. I think this is a guy that, that legitimately was honest because he looked at that Buffalo Bill team and said to himself, wow, they're actually built differently because this team is not taking these, they're not respecting me as the as Buffalo Bills did respect me. Because that's the thing. And when Buffalo didn't take him, Arizona got his revenge. And got the win against them back in 2020 when he had that big miracle catch. So, to me, this is a no-brainer that D Hop at this point won't be taken by Buffalo, but he will be taken by the Ravens, and he can do it all over again when they meet up again. I don't know if it will be in the playoffs or the regular season. I don't really know when it will meet up again, but I don't know if it's this year or not. But now that I remember that, now I can finally end this podcast now on that note. See, I, I knew it was going to come to me eventually because I have, you know, this idea in my head at this point that I'm going to stick with it here. Because Kyler Murray at this point, even when he does come back, who's he going to throw to? Zach Ertz will be gone. Marquise Brown's not going to play in Arizona with nobody at that, that, that quarterback. That team's going to suck. They're not going to be winners. They're going to be losers. In fact, Caleb Williams at this point should stay far away from Arizona as much as possible. Tim, they better hope that he better hope and pray that that, that team is not a one and done 0 and 17 team because they're not going to be good in 2023. They're not even with the draft selections they have. I mean that that team has got a lot of problems. I mean Kyle Murray being out for most of the year, you know him, you know Kyle Murray not being committed to Arizona, and, and that's another thing too. What happens to Kyle Murray when when Caleb Williams shows up there? Caleb Williams is taking that job. Kyle Murray's going. And you want to know my honest opinion about where Kyler Murray ends up going? If I had to put a, a team, you know, situational kind of feel to it, I think Kyler Murray would end up going to the Green Bay Packers. I think Kyler Murray would, would be better off there and playing with someone like Matt LaFleur, who understands his game, but can change it to where he can be a better thrower. Because right now you're getting a defensive coordinator that doesn't understand the Changing of a quarterback that need, that needs to be changed. You want somebody to get in your head? Matt Lafleur is your guy in Green Bay. So, and I think realistically that'd be an interesting scenario of the Packers and the Cardinals playing out an NFC title game at some point with Caleb Williams and and Kyler Murray. That would be an interesting NFC title game because then you ask yourself, all right, should should Jonathan? And worst case scenario, if Gannon is is still coaching. I don't think he will be. Who coaches then for Arizona then? Will it be Josh McDaniels? Will Josh McDaniels be the one that ends up being the next head coach for the Cardinals? Because I have a funny feeling this is how this is going to play out. The Rays are somehow going to fire Josh McDaniels at some point. Whether they have a winning season or not, he's going to go. There's just no other way of looking at it. Gannon's one and done at 0-17 at Conor Murray. So that's that. And then you have McDaniels then and Matt LaFleur then. You have that little tidbit of a matchup. That, that's a long ways to go. So, who knows? Anything, anything can happen now going forward. And who knows? Maybe McDaniels could end up being a coach for Tampa Bay. Maybe he could visit Tom Brady to come out of retirement and go back to Tampa Bay. Who knows? There's a lot on the table here. I That one I doubt very much, though. But now I can end this podcast with that. Uh, I'm watching AEW uh, Devil or Nothing tonight. I'll probably review that on Tuesday. Um, you have my social media and stuff like that. Snapchat. TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. I've said it a thousand times on this podcast. It's, it's, I, I, I'm sick of repeating it at this point. Uh, I may, I may put it in the description. I may not. Uh, other than that, I am signing off here. Uh, so uh, enjoy the rest of your week, guys. I am done. I will see you all on Tuesday. Oh.